Am I on? Hello, hello. Is this on? Am I on? Hello. Hey. Hey, there we are. Woo, how's everybody? Good? You good, Nick? I'm going to have the uh, worship team hold on just one sec. Because uh, y'all know we got to let it rain before we get started, right? Yeah. Uh, but actually, I actually want to do something without Howard's permission because I'm a rebel like that. Um, well, I'll just go ahead and throw it out there. July the 29th. Um, I'm going to bring, bring a crew with me. It's going to be about eight or ten of us that were locked up together on the Torres unit. We grew up in minute. We got saved together. Not on the same day, I don't think. But uh, we were raised up together on that unit. God raised us. God saved us there. Most some of there was a few guys that were saved before they got there, but God raised us up in the ministry there. And you've got guys that are insanely talented because God is good like that. Uh, a bunch of preachers, a bunch of teachers, the most insane bass guitarist you've ever heard in your life. Uh, he plays that thing like it's the lead guitar. Yeah. It's crazy, yeah. Um, there's drummers coming, singers, there's a little bit of everything coming. But if, if you guys aren't scared or intimidated by a house full of ex-felons, um, we would like to come and bless everybody here. If you want to bring your friends, bring your family. <clears throat> we just kind of want to do a couple things. One... We don't want to come and take over. They probably will because they're ex-offenders, but uh, we're not trying to take over anything. We're trying to come and bless some people because we have an advantage that somebody who didn't find God in prison, we have an advantage in prison that you guys don't get out here, and that's a whole lot of time, a whole lot of time to, uh, to spend with him and get to know him and grow up and a whole lot of time for him to pour in, pour in, pour in. And because of that, you can see the fruit in these men and uh, it's just been on my heart since before I ever came home that I, if I could ever build a crew of a bunch of men that had a lot of years to get away and let God just pour into them and pour into them and pour into them it was a dream of mine to come home and take a crew of these guys to come to churches and just pour out what God gave us and so if that doesn't bother you too bad I would like to bring a crew let's do it at the end of July, and I, and I pray it doesn't intimidate anybody. I, I pray that it gets some of you excited because you're going to see and hear some stuff you wouldn't ever get to see. Uh, and they'll share some stories and things like that. But uh, I can't explain to you what God does when these men get together. And part of it's because the bond that we have in there, part of it's because of what all God did while we're in there. But I, I pray that you will come, and not only that, but I pray that you'll bring your kids. I pray that you'll bring youth. I pray that you'll bring your family. Pray that you be your friend, because I'm just expecting God to do something big. Because God did something big to every one of us individually in that place, and he did something big um, as a group. And um, we did ministry together every day in that place. So we know how we, each other act. We know how each other, uh, how we respond to one another. We know how God uses each guy, and there's no competition. There's no competition between these guys. When it's his time to operate in his gift, everybody steps aside and lets God use him. When it's this man's time for God to use, everybody steps aside and we, we cheerlead. We push him. We want to see God just come through this guy in a mighty way. There's no competition like there is at a lot of churches. You know, I don't want your gift to be better than mine. You know, or my gift must not be important because nobody even knows what even God does for me. You know, the, the intercessors, the people that are praying at home, the grandmas that are praying at home for hours and hours and hours, they never get invited up on the stage and get introduced. And nobody applauds what they do. But I can't tell you how many people got saved because of that grandma that was praying for years and years and years and hours and hours and hours. So just as a, a small, small taste, uh, actually a, there's a gentleman that I was locked up with that's here in this room. He came up to Dallas to do a business conference and he stayed uh, the weekend, so I asked him to come down today. And I don't even know what he wants to do, but if he'd like to do a song, if it's cool with it. Chino, you want to do a song? I'm not asking because you have a choice. I was just <laughs> wanting you to feel good about it. His name is Lorenz San Pedro. 
and his family is from the Philippines. We met probably 2008. Uh, 2008. God, I, I'm not going to eat up a bunch of time because I want God to do his thing, but he's very special to me because uh, God used this guy lots and lots of times to speak prophecy into my life, lots and lots of times to encourage me. I really struggled with preaching. I met him the year I surrendered to preach. <laughs> I was scared to death, didn't think it was a gift, uh, tried to run from it. But this guy has spoken so much life and encouragement into me since uh, 10 years ago. Um, but not only that, God put it on his heart one day to uh, call me to the back of the prison dorm and say, hey, I don't know what's going on, but God has told me I need to pray over you and uh, anoint you for ministry. I said, okay. And I didn't think a whole lot about it because we have so many God moments in there, we almost take them for granted. We just expect him to move. It's a weird thing for him not to move. Instead of leaving here at church one saying, man, God really showed up and everybody's surprised by it. We would be surprised if God didn't show up and do some kind of miracle. So he calls me to the back and says, God's asked me to ordain you. And I said, okay. So we go to the back and we're praying. He, he prays this beautiful prayer. And it was all good, but nothing meant as much to me as the end of it. When he was wrapping up the prayer, he said, God, on this day, uh, 28th day of October, we're thankful that uh, we get to bless Jason for uh, ministry. When he said that, God just took me on this memory lane. And my great-grandmother was the one who prayed over me since I was a kid. And I have these memories of waking up in the middle of the night with her rubbing my back saying, God, make this one a preacher. Me too. Whew, wait. Why did you come, man? Yeah. Why are you making me cry too? Whoa, wait. Like, She passed away the first year I was locked up on April the 28th without ever hearing me preach. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't even really make me sad that she didn't hear me preach because um, I know she hears, but the, the thing that I really love about my brothers that were locked up <clears throat> is they're not afraid to get away and listen until God speaks. They're not going to get up in front of people and fabricate something. They're not going to get up and, and try to make something sound good or churchy or whatever. They're going to get away. They're going to lock themselves up in their cell or in a room. They're going to go on a fast. And they're not going to come out and they're not going to speak until God's told them something specific. So for him to come to me on that day when I thought nothing of it, hey, God, is, I don't know why today, but God's told me we need to ordain you today. But then when he said the date at the end of the prayer, I mean, it was like, wow. The person who knew from the time I was a little bitty kid that I was going to preach one day, um, it was on that specific day. And I just thought that was, uh, I don't know, it's just a cool, another thousand, one of the million cool things that God did. But uh, anyway, Chino is here today before he goes home. And... Uh, just wanted him to take a few minutes to bless you guys, whatever. Um, if, he, if he wants to do a song, which he does, um, I can let, him do a, let him do a song. If he wants to share whatever's on his heart, that's fine. And then I still want to do Let It Rain, though, before we, before we preach. So uh, you want a microphone or you want this thing? What you can hear me? Yeah. Oh, that's pretty, that's pretty uh, right. intimate environment. How y'all doing? So, I told us you know, and, uh, we met in prison in 2008. I did 10 years. I've been out three years. And uh, he spoke how uh, the Lord speaks to me prophetically. And actually, this morning, as I got some whole time, locked myself away in the room, the Lord gave me a word for this church. He said, surround them with songs of deliverance. Surround them with songs of deliverance. And it comes from Psalms. 32. Uh, Psalm 32 says, and I'll read it from the New Living Translation. It says, For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. Now, the King James says songs of deliverance. And that, that word deliverance in the Hebrew meaning means to rest. It means to deliver. It, it, 
what's interesting about also that one word, there's, there's a specific trend, uh, uh, Hebrew translation that the Lord spoke to me for this church. It means to cast forth. To cast forth. Psalms of the Lord's God is casting this church forth. And the idea behind that actually is new birth. New birth for this church. Yes. Now I know, uh, I think uh, there's going to be a good pastor or something like that. There is. Wow, praise God. There he is right there. Can you come over here for a second? Who needs water? Who needs? Who needs to come to God? And sometimes. 
just a change in position helps you go higher and experience dirt. So I'm going to actually call that worship king after all. So if you want to come over here, I'm going to sing a song about it. So I want the worship king here because the worship king in the individual are always the first front line. They're always the front line. And uh, I want them to be.
to go to speak to our hearts to speak to us to go to our hearts to speak to our hearts that you lead us along paths that lead to greater things that you don't want us to water that you want us to have the wisdom to do this so I thank you Lord God that you don't want us the looseness and the hope. Today, let us not walk away from it. But I have to pray in my hearts. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus'
She went out back. <laughs> Hope y'all don't get tired of that song. We're gonna do it once a month. <laughs> For sure. We do it in the prison too. And man, it gets crazy. Huh? Yeah. You gotta you gotta step inside the prison for about five minutes when they sing that song. You'll see two or three hundred guys just on their face. I'll look, look like a grenade went off in that place. Just trying to get somewhere and get away and get with God. They don't care about nobody watching them. They don't care about nothing. They're going to be on their face somewhere. Or, or they just start praying for each other. It's, just, it's crazy. God just starts raining in that place, man. Whew. Everybody good? I hope so. Happy Father's Day to the fathers. God, happy Father's Day. 
I found out something probably, I guess an hour ago. I figured out what God's biggest struggle is. Never really think about God struggling, right? I figured out what his, it's got to be. It's got to be God's biggest struggle. And it's so, so simple. And uh, I came in late, was waiting in the back. And then uh, the girls finally saw that I was here, so they came running back there, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And uh, Hattie came up second, and she said, you know, bend down and give me a hug. So she just gives me this big, long hug. She goes, Daddy, I love you. Happy Father's Day. And in that moment, obviously, you're just overwhelmed with all that girly stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so you're just overwhelmed with that. And my, my first thought was, she has no idea what she means to me. And there are no words to try to tell her what's all going on in here. And those are my thoughts. Like She has no idea what she means to me, and that there just aren't the right words to even tell her that it's going to come close. And then, of course, God does his little whisper, and he goes, I feel the same way. And then I start thinking, God obviously loves us, right? Well, how come it's not written all throughout the Bible, God saying, hey, I love you. Hey, I love you. And I'm trying to think of a verse that even says it. What does it say? That's a good one. That's a good one. Got my Rolodex over here. Can you think of another one? point is, can you think of a bunch of them where God specifically says, I love you? Mm -hmm. Okay, that one's kind of by proxy. Does he ever say, I love you? Besides your Jeremiah. You did good on that one. I couldn't think of that one. My point is, there's just not a whole bunch of verses that God just comes right out and says, I love you, over and over and over again. Does God love you? Yes. Do we ever question it? So why does he not specifically say, I love you? Because there are no words to adequately, adequately come close to how he really loves us. So what do you have to do? You have to show it. No greater love that is there than this, than a man lay down his life. God, who invents language, can't find a way to tell you that he loves you adequately enough God who not only creates language but creates the whole concept of love cannot even try to explain or express or put into words how much he loves you my thoughts back there with Hattie she doesn't have a clue how I feel about her and I have no way to convey that with my words God can not either so he has to show us and there's no greater love than him laying down his life for us and then you start thinking, if he loves you enough to lay down his life for you, how adequate is it really to even say I love you? Like, how does that compare? Should you say it? Sure, you should say it. But how, can you even compare the two? Somebody saying I love you versus get out of the way, let me do this for you. And lays down his life for you without you asking. But as few times as he just specifically says I love you, there's lots of times I can think of where he asks you, do you love me? And he knows, so why does he ask? Man, because <laughs> we don't show it. That's good stuff, because we don't show it. My, uh, my dad didn't run around all the time saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, but he showed it. But I grew up craving that a lot. And then I ended up in prison, and then one day I'm probably 24, 25 years old, and I'm sitting here wondering, man, I know my dad loves me. Why did we never say that to each other? So I had wrote him this letter. I was like, man, what's the deal, man? How come, you, how come we don't say that to each other? How come we never said it, that to each other? How come we didn't say we love you? How come we didn't say we're proud of you? You know, it just makes me wonder, did I do, did I, I know I did something wrong, but that I do something wrong my whole life to keep somebody from saying that. And his letter back just blew me away. He's like, how did you not know that I was proud of you? See the two different perspectives? I'm sitting here craving it. I want to hear it. And my dad's like, how, how did you not know that I was proud of you? 
kind of blew me away. Something that we need. Fatherhood. It's kind of weird to talk about fatherhood at church because church is probably about 80% women, right? So do you still talk about, so I was going to say, hey, for Father's Day, we're going to talk about motherhood. <laughs> but you don't have to be a man to understand fatherhood because women are directly affected by fatherhood as well, right? I was thinking about this. Um, the story in the Old Testament, there's R Rachel and Jacob, and they're having a son. And Rachel's dying giving birth to this son. And it's pretty intense. It's a pretty horrible labor. It's going to cost her her life to deliver this son, even though the son was promised. Well, the labor was so bad, and she's complaining about her sorrow, which she had the right to. It was so bad, when she has the son, she names him Ben-Onai, which means son of my sorrow. Your labor is so bad, like the first moments of your son's life, you just threw prophecy on him. Son of my sorrow, that's going to be your name. Hey, what's your name? I'm my mom's sorrow. <laughs> you know, that's a great story. But immediately, Benjamin steps up. I'm sorry. Uh, Jacob stands up and he goes, no, your name's going to be Benjamin, which means son of my right hand or son of my strength. And then you start thinking about it. All the kings come out of that lineage from Benjamin. So the dad had enough sense to step up and say, that's not what we're going to say. Because, you know, they didn't even name the kids. A lot of times, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, they didn't name their kids the first day. That kid may be six, seven, eight days old before he gets his name. Because they were looking for something prophetic, something to speak into this kid's life. Because they knew very directly how they named this kid. It was going to kind of pave the way for the path of his life. So right off the bat, mom says, you're going to be son of my sorrow. Dad steps up and says, no, 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 no. No, we're not going down that road. Son of my right hand, son of my strength. And lo and behold, what happens through the rest of his life? All the great kings come out of that lineage. So what if dad didn't step up? What if dad said nothing? He's like, you know what, if that's what you want to name him. I wonder how the story would have came out. And then you read stories we've talked about before. One of my favorite stories, y'all know, know about David. Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. But when I started studying fatherhood way back when I was locked up, because... The guys in prison, about 80% of the men in prison either don't know their dad straight up, never met him, or they know of him, but he was never in the house. Or he was there and he was unavailable, didn't even care about him. 80%. Do you think there's a reason why we're filling up prison with men? You feel like there's a reason why we've got to keep building? You know, just 30, I was reading some stuff the other day, just 30 years ago or so, we only had about... 30-something prisons in Texas. There's almost 150 prisons in Texas 30 years later. And there's nothing new under the sun. Did we think of new things to do to break, break the law? No. What's going on? Within a 30-year span, we need 100 more prisons. And steadily wanting to build more, and steadily wanting to build more, and steadily wanting to build more. Do you think there's a common thread why 80% of them don't know their dad or don't have a relationship with him. The female prison population, it's growing like crazy too. How do all of a sudden we have this many women that are hooked and addicted to meth? How did we get them out of the home from raising children? How did we get the men out of the home from helping raise the children and being the provider? Instead of being the provider, we're stealing everything to support a drug habit. Where did we go wrong? Well, I'll tell you where it started. It started with the father somewhere. It started with the father. And this isn't a sermon to even beat dads up. This is, I want to bring, make you start thinking about some things, how important it is. Because I know a lot, I have a lot of friends that run from that responsibility. You were ready to lay down with somebody and have kids, but when the kid came, you freaked out. And you have the nerve to tell the woman, I'm not ready for this. But she is. She was ready for it. Like she was ready in her mind like, I'm going to take this chance with him. If he leaves, oh well, I got this. You think that ever crossed her mind? But the man has the nerve to say, hey, I'm just not ready. I'm sorry. Good luck with that. And if that's happened to somebody in this room, I'm sorry. I'm not here to beat you up. You probably did that for a reason. Everybody here knows somebody that's in that situation, right? Some people may have been in the situation, may, may be in the situation, whatever. But the point is, somewhere along the way, that man thought that was okay. And he just minimizes the whole part of what it is to raise a child. 
not knowing, not knowing two things. One, not knowing what he just calls the road that that kid's going to end up going down. But two, the, the, probably the biggest, biggest hurt of the whole deal is not knowing how he could have caused that child to go. There's a couple things in uh, Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says that he created us in his image, and then he gives us a couple things to do right away. He says uh, to have dominion over the earth, conquer and all that. But he says, I want you to fill the earth, and I want you to multiply. And when I read that a long time ago, I just thought God was being repetitive to make it stick, because those both sound like numbers to me. Fill it with numbers, multiply. Basically, have babies and have a bunch of them. Hallelujah. Fill the place up. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> have babies and have a bunch of them. But y'all know my motto, God wastes nothing, right? So he wouldn't use fill and then multiply for no reason at all. And fill means exactly that. Fill it. Fill it with numbers. 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 Have babies. Multiply. Fill the earth. Fill the earth. Fill it up. Because I want you to have dominion over it. How are you going to have dominion over it if there's only a couple of you? Fill it up. We want to have dominion over everything. Fill this thing up. Fill it up. Fill it up. And multiply. You know how sin is an archer's term to miss the mark? Multiply is an archer's term. And it means to raise them with a target in mind. Matter of fact, it means to raise them with a specific target in mind. A bullseye. Proverbs says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's older he will not depart from it. Why is that? Because you raise them with a specific target in mind. The fathers in Jewish history and Hebrew culture, they would take their kids out, especially their sons, they would take them out and they would show them nature. They would look for life lessons in everyday nature. While they're out there doing that, the father's also teaching his son the family trade. While he's teaching the family trade, he's looking for specific things in his son. Natural gifts, natural talents that God put in there. He wasn't like it is today. Son, when you grow up, you're going to go to A&M. Because I went to A&M. And, and your dad, no, we don't go to UT. Huh? Y'all are fired, get out of the church. Excommunicated. You're going to go to the school that I want you to go to. You're going to play the position that I want you to. And if you don't make the quarterback, then you're not a real man. If you don't come in first place, you're not a real man. Anybody have fathers like that? You can never do good enough. Anybody in the room? Anybody in the room? Anybody in the room listening? Anybody in the room listening? All right. Nobody had a dad that was that way that pushed you, pushed you, pushed you. Nothing was good enough. We had a couple of them. Okay. How many had dads that just weren't involved? There we are. There Y'all were listening. I was on the wrong mark. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Y'all don't have to raise your hands on this one because I'll be obligated to come get you. But don't raise your hand. But how many that's in that group where dad wasn't involved, how many of you are still offended by that today? How many of you are still stuck in that place in a lot of ways? How many of you have a hard time relating to God as your father because of the way your father was? So when some churchy person comes along and says, you know, God really loves you. Okay. You know, God is your father. Great. That's all I need is two. <laughs> the first one did so great. Lots of the world has a hard time relating to God as their father, at least a good one because of the way that their dad was. And again, this isn't to beat anybody up. It's just, to, do you know that you were supposed to relate to God as your father? Did you know that the design was that your real earthly father was to raise you and love you and be there for you in a way to where you could easily relate God as your father? He wanted that because he, he created us in his image. We were going to represent God on this earth. We're going to be just like him. So your earth, earthly father was supposed to act and raise you in a way to where it would be so easy and second nature you wouldn't question God. I know God is real. I watch my, my dad worship him all the time. I watch my dad sing to him all the time. I watch my dad pray to him all the time. I watch my dad walk this thing out. Of course, God loves me. Of course, God is my father. Look, we got so far away from that. Now people run from fatherhood, and we're filling up the prisons. And then here comes all these sons that don't know what to do. And now we got what we have now is where instead of having fathers, now we have gamers. Nothing against playing games. But when you're 30 years old and you still live with mom and dad and the highlight of your day is PlayStation 3 and 4 and whatever else they've come out with, we got a problem. You're not working. You're not providing. One of the things from being a father is you're supposed to be a provider. You're not working. So the wife is working and she's taking care of the kids and she's taking care of the house and she's... And then you're gaming. 
I'll protect you if something happens. Somebody tries to break in, I got them. Other than that, don't bother me when I'm playing. We've gotten so far away from fatherhood. But it started a long time ago. With social media, with the way it is to get news easily now, now it's just on a grander scale. We can see it, we can hear about it more readily available. But it was happening way back in the Bible days. David is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. The Israelites wanted a king so bad because God wasn't enough. So we want a king. We want somebody physical in our face, a man to tell us what to do. Give us one of those. So he gives them a king. goes, you're not going to like it. He's going to take all your money. He's going to take your kids. He's going to take the men. You're not going to like it. But I'll give you a king if that's what you want. So he gives them a king. The king disobeys God. God says, hey, I'm going to tear the throne from him. I'm going to raise somebody up that's, got, that's a man after my own heart. So he speaks to the prophet. And he tells him, hey, I want you to go and I want you to talk to this guy named Jesse. And one of his kids is who I'm going to raise up to be the king. We're going to anoint one of those guys to be the king. So go there, set them apart, consecrate them, let's raise up a king. So all his sons, apparently, he said he told him to go get all of his sons. He brings seven boys in front of Saul, of Samuel. And Samuel says, okay, we're going to allow these sons to pass by and God's going to speak to me who we're going to anoint as the king. And the first one comes and apparently he looks just like King Saul because he's tall and he's good looking. And so even Samuel the prophet's like, surely this is going to be him. Because he's tall, he's good looking, he just looks like king material. And he passes by and God says, no, not him. Man looks like the outer appearance. God looks at the heart. That's not him. And so they go through all seven sons. That's not him, that's not him, that's not him. And now Samuel's like, well, God sent me here to anoint one of these kids as the king. Are these all of your sons? Oh, well, there's this one. There's this one, but he's out there taking care of the sheep. And Samuel says, and go get him because we're not even going to sit down and eat until he gets here. Nobody's thinking about David. David's a boy, like literally a boy. We're talking eight, nine years old, boy. And he gets sent outside to take care of the sheep. What does that mean? There's very few nights he even sleeps in the house. Shepherds would stay out there with the sheep. So not only was he not even considered king material, the dude wasn't even allowed in the house most of the time. You stay out there with the sheep. That's what you're good for. You take care of that. In here we do grown man stuff. And Samuel says, you go get him and we're not going to sit down until he gets here. And this young boy comes in and as soon as Samuel sees him, he goes, that's him. We're going to anoint him as king. So you can imagine the jealousy in the house with all the brothers, especially the older brothers, the good looking ones, the big ones. You know they're clowning him. King? How are you going to be a king? Man, I'll beat you to death. <laughs> Before I let you be king. Because not only does it mean he's going to be king, he's going to be king over them. He's going to be the boss. Yeah, the eight-year-old, the big man is looking at the eight-year-old like, that's going to be my boss. He anoints him. And I'm not even sure what all David went through. But God did some really cool stuff, and this isn't even the point of the story, so I'm not going to go far into it. But I was just thinking today about how much we complain about the evil, and we complain about the bad things that have happened to us, right? It's just like us going to prison. On our way down there, we're scared to death, and like, oh my gosh, life is over, and... Uh, how am I going to get out and what woman's going to marry me and will I ever be a dad and who's going to hire me when I come home and you're just going through this whole list of stuff that's just never, never going to happen. Life's over. And then all these years later, you're like, oh, okay, God, you're, you're cool like that. Yeah. Okay, you know, what you, you know what you're doing, right? So, um, so Saul disobeys God and the Bible says that God sent a tormenting spirit to Saul. It wasn't just Satan jumping on him to attack him. This was God like, get over there. God sent a tormenting spirit. And because of that, somebody around the king had enough sense to say, hey, that's a tormenting spirit from God. Maybe we can go find somebody that plays the harp and send the tormenting spirit away. Somebody in that group just happens to know this kid that plays the harp. And this kid just happens to be David. And somebody gets him and he comes and he plays the harp and the tormenting spirit goes away every time he does it. So the king falls in love with this boy David. Loves him, wants to protect him, brings him into the fold. Now guess what he's learning as a kid, before he gets anointed. He's learning what kings do. He already knows how to lead because he's been a shepherd all this time, but now he's up in the house with the king learning what kings do before he ever gets to become the king. It just blows me away how all the stuff that we think is meant to destroy is how God uses evil over and over and over again to make his plans still come to pass. I just can't figure out why when I get in the middle of some deep stuff, I can't stop and think that. 
Like God has done it over and over and over again. And I can look at my past and see all this stuff where Satan tried to throw me off. But in the middle of it, whenever life gets tough, I can't stop and think, you know what? God's fixing to use this for his good. I get wrapped up in it every time. Like, gosh, <laughs> this is going to happen and this is going to happen. We go down this, you know, this lane of everything bad that's going to happen. So anyway, David's anointed as king. He's getting to learn from the king. The Israelites go to war with the Philistines. Everybody's scared to death of the Philistines. David shows up as a boy and he goes, hey, why are y'all letting this dude make fun of God in the army? Whenever I came against the bear, I killed the bear. Whenever I came against the lion, I killed the lion. Just the same thing I did to that bear and that lion, I'm going to do to that giant. Let me go get him. David convinces the king to do that. You feeling okay, Nick? Your chest hurting? We need to pray? You don't need prayer? Your chest is hurting, you don't need prayer? We're going to pray anyway, you ready? Ready? Lord God, we just thank you for this day that you've given us and blessed with. I thank you for Nick. Uh, whatever's going on with his chest, Lord God, you're bigger than that. And I thank you that you're the God that heals. You're the God, our provider, Lord. And I pray that you just touch him right now with your power, with your presence. Lord, that Satan wouldn't be able to distract him, Lord God, that you would just heal whatever's going on. The pain would go away. Everything in his body would line up with your will for his life and your word, Lord God. We just call him healed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love you, man. Y'all know the story. David, was, he was a shepherd all this time. He learns the tools with the stones, the slingshots, all that stuff. That's what he was raised doing, what God had already taught him to do. Now he comes up against the enemy, and Saul's like, hey, here's my armor, use it. Hey, here's my sword, use that. Just keep it in mind that Saul is head and shoulders above every man in Israel. And he's given his armor to an eight-year-old boy. Can you picture that? Hey, what he's saying is, is this is my identity. This is how God always used me. I'm too scared to go face the giant but you have the courage to go do it, so here, take the stuff that I would use. A man that is head and shoulders above every man in Israel is giving his armor to an eight-year-old boy. And the Bible says that he can't even walk. I can't walk in this. Like, what do you want? How am I going to go kill somebody and I can't walk? So he takes it off, and he goes back to what God gave him, what God used him out there fighting the lion and the bear. He takes his staff, he takes his stone, he takes a slingshot, Goes to the giant, takes the very first stone, does his thing, sinks it in the middle of the guy's forehead, kills him, takes that guy's sword, cuts his head off. <laughs> this eight-year-old boy's got a head of a giant, and he's carrying it through town. That sends a statement. That dude's carrying some giant's head, and everybody's in town like, that's going to be our king. Some of them may have been excited because he can defeat giants, and some of them might have been like, a little nervous, like, we better not mess up. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? The dude's going to be toting our head through town. So he takes the head back, he shows everybody, but there's something really amazing. There's a couple things in that story. Get this. When it came time for them to pick a king, David was not even considered. There was nothing in him. God saw it the whole time. God's been raising this kid up since before the foundation of the world. But everybody that knew David never considered him, never saw nothing. He wasn't even a consideration. Do you understand what I'm saying? In the eyes of man, it wasn't even a consideration. There was no reason to bring David to the house. But that's who God picked. His own, his own father, if I can get dramatic with it, his own father was told by the prophet, one of your sons is going to be the king. Wouldn't you want all of your sons to be there just in case? Because you don't know which one it is. But your own father does not see fit to even bring you in the house for the ceremony because there's no way it could be you. Does that send a message to that boy? Thank God that David knew God out in the pasture because his dad could have done some kind of wound to his heart that was going to cost him the rest of his life or he'd have never followed God. But because David had already met God, and that's where all your psalms come from, the majority of your psalms that we read, psalms, there's 150 psalms, the majority of them are written out there in that pasture. David's diary, yeah. Thank God he already knew him. The other cool thing I think about that story is, is the question that Saul asked him when he comes back with, David, with the giant's head. He's got the head. Hey, that was no thing. I told y'all. Just let me at him. Turn me loose. This boy goes and kills this giant. And what is the question that the king asked? Did he ask him, how'd you do that? Hey, where did you get your courage to do that? Hey, where did you get the boldness? Hey, what made you feel like you could even do that? Hey, you weren't scared of dying? No, what was the question that Saul asked him? 
Who's your father? Of all the questions you could ask a eight year old boy that just chopped off a giant's head, who's your father? And of course, he says what we would hear, well, my father is Jesse of Bethlehem. But if you understand anything about Hebrew, Jesse means pretty much all the names of God. The everlasting one. Past, present, future. I am, provider, savior, on and on and on. If you look it up in the concordance, it's a paragraph what Jesse means. Who's your father? Saul, we would have heard Jesse because that's what he said. But Saul knew God, at least knew of him. David knows God. When he says Jesse, what does Saul hear? My dad? Yeah, you might know him. He's the great I am. From Bethlehem, the house of bread, the provider. God is my provider, the I am. That's who my dad is. My dad is I am. My dad is God. That's who my dad is. Then you get to this story of Gideon, which we've gone over before, but I'll just hit the highlights because this is what I want to share with you before we leave today. The story of Gideon goes like this. There's so many stories in the Old Testament that start off with, again, the Israelites did wrong in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> and it says the word again. Again, the Israelites did wrong in the sight of the Lord. And he handed them over, and he handed them over, and he handed them over. Does God hand anybody over because he gives up? No, he always hands over to teach you a lesson. And he's going to provoke you to jealousy and cause you to come back. But he will hand you over because, hey, you don't want my favor? Hey, I'll take the favor off. Let me know how that works out. I'll talk to you when you get back. Again, they did wrong on the side of the Lord, so God hands them over to the Midianites, which is basically five huge cities. They had the Israelites so scared that the Israelites would hide in the mountains and they're digging caves and living a life totally different than what they're used to living because they live on the land and live in tents and travel. They've got them so scared they're up in the mountains hiding in caves and things like that. The Midianites were so bad that they would wait until it was crop season and whenever they would get some little shot at getting some food, they would just run down on the Israelites and take everything. Animals, food, and everything. Trying to starve them to death. So you come up on the story in Judges chapter 5 and 6. And when you come up on the story, it talks about this man named Gideon. And it says that Gideon was hiding in his threshing wheat. Just trying to make a little bit of bread is just something to eat. But the point is, one, he's hiding, and two, that he's threshing wheat in the cave. Because you don't thresh wheat in the cave. If you want to thresh wheat and you don't want to do it the hard way, you find the highest point in the city, hopefully some kind of hill, and you take the, the big old bales of wheat and you throw it up in the air. And the wind comes through and it takes the chaff and the shells and all the useless stuff and it blows it away, and the good wheat, the solid stuff, falls to the ground. And it's a whole lot easier to collect all that stuff. So you throw it up in the air, you let the wind do its job, the good stuff falls to the ground. And then you, you harvest that up and you go make your bread or whatever it is that you want to do. He's in a cave trying to thresh wheat with a wine press. And a wine press is this big bowl-like structure. And they would throw the grapes down in there. It was a big circle. And then there was this huge stone that they would put up drill a hole through it, then have a stick in there, and you'd have to put several men on it, and you'd roll this stone around in a circle to press all these grapes to try to get all the, the juice out. Now, if by design you thresh wheat by throwing it up in the air and letting the wind do the work, and the good stuff falls down, you just gather it up, there's a hard shell around this stuff that you want the wind to blow away so you don't have to pick up all these shells, okay? This guy's in a wine press, has wheat off in this tunnel, and he's crushing all the chaff off of it to get to the wheat. So not as, he just, not as he just hiding from the enemy, but he's so scared of them taking his food, he's just made his job a thousand times harder. Because now he's just crushing everything, so he's got to pick the chaff out of there, the, everything, just to get to a little bit of wheat. That's how bad these times are. So he's hiding. He's a scared man. He's not a man of courage. He's not a man of strength, anything like that. And then God shows up. He sends an angel to him. And the first thing the angel says, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. I'm sure Gideon was looking over his shoulder like, who are you talking to? But God shows up and he says, you mighty man of valor. Because God always sees you where you're going. He always sees your potential. He always knows what you're doing. God don't ever look at you in your circumstance. Never. Before you were ever born, God looked at you from where you were going to end up. 
what you were going to do. So while we waste all that time and guilt and shame and beating ourselves up and all that, and the, the junk you're in, the, like today, the junk that you're in, in the, even though we're sitting in the middle of Driven Life Church, the junk that you're going through right now, knowing that you're doing wrong, knowing that you're not doing right, and you're wallowing in all this self-pity, God is not even looking at you in that mess. Amen. You're spending all that time giving Satan just a field day to beat you up and have his way with you, and God's not even looking at you in your mess. God is looking at you like the man, like the woman that was covered by the blood of Jesus and what you've done for him, what you're going to do for him. The end. He's always looking at the end. Does, he, does it mean he doesn't see you where you're at? No. Does it mean he doesn't see the mess? No. What, your mess doesn't move him. Where you're at today does not move him. So even though you don't feel like a mighty man of valor or a mighty woman of valor, God can still show up in the middle of your mess and say, get in, you mighty man of valor. So God shows up, speaks to him, and then he tells him this. He says, I'm going to use you to single-handedly deliver my people away from the enemy, the Philistines. Long story short, again, this is not part of the deal, so we'll, we'll blow through the highlights in case you don't know the story. So Gideon is like me. He's not very trusting at all. It's not enough for God to show up and say, you mighty man of valor, you're going to deliver my people from the enemy. That's not enough. Okay, how do I know it's really you? Right? So he tells him a couple things to do. First he says, um, let me say this about fatherhood. I just thought about something else. Gideon says, okay, if it's really you, stay right here. I'm going to go make a meal, basically a sacrifice, and bring it to you and present it to you. So he goes and he makes the meal. He brings it to the angel. The angel sticks the rod on there, and it goes up in smoke, catches fire, which means he accepted the sacrifice. Gideon is fixing to ask him a load of questions about, is this really you? But first, he's given an order, and he's told, I want you to go into town, and where that altar is at, of Baal that your dad set up, I didn't think about this this morning, that altar that your dad set up, that Baal guy that y'all are running around worshiping all the time, I want you to go tear it down before we do anything. So he's already breaking generational curses right now is what he's trying to set him up to do. I know your father is worshiping Baal, but we're fixing to tear all that down, knowing that that could cost him his life. And it almost does because the people in the town want to kill him once he does it. They wake up in the morning and the altars of Baal are torn down. But that was God's first order of business. I don't even care what your father did. I don't even care what your great-grandpa did. I don't care about all the bad things you've ever learned. I don't care about all the bad traditions you got in your family. We're going to start with you. Me and you, we've got a relationship now. Go tear down all that stuff that you've been taught. Let's start over. So then Gideon, he's got to go through this laundry list of stuff. Is this really you? God, if it's really you, I'm going to throw a fleece down. If it's really you, I want the fleece to be wet and the ground to be dry. Wakes up the next morning, the fleece is wet and the ground is dry. Man, okay, but if it's really, really you, like for real, for real, like no joking this time, for real, for real, for real, if it's really you this time, tomorrow morning, let the fleece be dry and all the ground be wet. Then I'll know. Wakes up the next morning, the fleece is dry and all the ground is wet. So God says, now it's time to build an army. Gather the people together. We want some men to go to war. 32,000 guys show up. That's a good little click. That's a good gang right there. God gang. 32 deep. 32,000 deep. They all show up and God says, that's too many. Because I want the glory for this. I told you that me and you were going to deliver the children away from the enemy. So just make this comment and you tell all the men, hey, anybody that's afraid, here's your free pass, y'all can go home. So he gives them a speech, says, hey, any of you men that are afraid, y'all can leave. You don't have to be here. 22,000 men leave. 22,000 men leave. Pretty good example where we are at as far as men go. We don't know nothing about courage. We're not taught that stuff, you know? So 22,000 people leave. We got 10,000 men left. God says that's still too many. Now I want you to take them down to the river and I want you to watch. We're going to separate them. <clears throat> watch for the men that get down there and they lap like a dog, bringing the, the water up from their hands to their mouth. And then watch for the guys that get down on their knees to get a drink directly out of the water. <clears throat> the Bible says that there was 300 men 
that would lap like a dog that put their hand in the water and bring it up to their mouth. And Gus says, that's your, that's your army right there, those 300. We started out with 32,000. I'm sure Gideon felt pretty good. Like, 32,000? We, hey, we got this. And Gus like, no, 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 take 300. Take 300. Can you imagine seeing 32,000 men and like you're ready to go to war with these guys? And then you're looking at a crowd of 300 right after that. I'm like, oh, man. I don't feel so good about this. You take those 300 and here's what we're going to do. Everybody's going to get a torch. Everybody's going to get a pitcher. You're going to cover it up. And then what's your weapon of choice? There's no Uzis or machine guns. They get a trumpet is what they get. So not only are you going with 300 people, you're, y'all are locked and loaded with trumpets. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. If I didn't feel safe, I sure don't now. So uh, we're going to play them to death. So he sends them out there and he breaks them up into hunt groups of 100. So there's three groups of 100. And basically, they wait till nightfall. I'm sorry, I got to back up one second. He broke it down to 300, and Gideon is still just ridden with fear, like fear is all over him. So God goes, Look, man, you're still not getting it. Here's what I want you to do. He goes, You can go ahead and go to war, but if you're not ready yet, go down there to the enemy's camp tonight and just listen. I want you to hear something. So, him and his buddy, they go down there and they listen. And while they're listening, they hear two guys that are from the enemy side. Talking about a dream he had, he goes, man, I heard, I saw this barley loaf running down into our camp and it just destroyed all the tents and everything. And the buddy says, man, that's Gideon. God's going to use Gideon to destroy us. I mean, how much more does God need to do to tell you, you know, when the enemy's like, knows your name and knows that you're going to come kill him. So then he's ready to go. So then he gets his group of 300 and all the game plan is just this. They're going to wait till dark. They're going to surround the camps down there up on the hill. They're going to scream, they're going to uh, break the pitcher when they break the pit, because it's going to keep the torch dark. When they break the pitcher, the torch is going to light up. So you got all this bright light all of a sudden. You're going to blow your trumpet and scream the sword of the Lord and Gideon. That was the battle plan. Don't be nervous, just go. There's five cities worth of military waiting on you down there. Five cities worth of military. And you got a trumpet and a torch. And you're going to scream the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And that's as far as God tells you to go. They go down there. They break, they break the pitchers. The torch light up. It, conf- it scared them to death. But it caused so much confusion that all the enemy starts pulling their swords and killing each other. The enemy kills it, each other. What did you say? They turn on themselves. They start killing each other. And then what few were left, they take off running. And so then Gideon and his 300, they finally chased them down. Never actually had to do anything. When he met Gideon, was he a mighty man of valor? Not to us. To God? Yeah. I know where you're going. So I can show up and I can say stuff like that. It ain't a bunch of feel-good stuff. God knows where you're going. Hey, you mighty man of valor. But here's the thing that I want to teach you. There's the concept of father- fatherhood all throughout the Bible. It starts in the beginning and it ends with fatherhood. Fatherhood, fatherhood. But there's a process because people are saying, I don't know who I am. I don't know what my identity is. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what my gifts are. In the Bible, here's what happened with Gideon, and here's the whole concept. You have fatherhood, which is God's concept. The way that he establishes contact with us is through intimacy. When that intimacy happens, the angel of the Lord showing up to talk to Gideon, he found his identity because God told it to him. Hey, you mighty man of valor. Because he got his identity, mighty man of valor, his purpose came next. Hey, I'm going to use you to lead my people out of the the hands of the enemy. It's the same way for us. So when people are saying, hey, I don't know my identity, I don't know my purpose, it's really easy. It's so easy, people don't want to hear it. You've got to spend time with God. Because without intimacy between you and the Father, you won't find out who you are in Christ. And if you don't find out who you are in Christ, then you don't ever find out your gifts and your talents to go find out your purpose. There's got to be intimacy between you and your father. And it's so easy. I'm thankful for that little picture today. Whenever Hattie came up and she gave me that hug, and she goes, oh, happy Father's Day. I love you, Dad. I was like, man, this girl has no idea. You know what she means to me. I have no way to even tell her. And God's like, yeah, I feel the same way. I have the same struggle. I've been trying to tell you, I've been trying to show you over and over and over and over again. And you still have the nerve to wake up some days and feel like you've got nothing to offer. Like, what else do I got to do? So fatherhood, us fathers being intentional with our kids, it's not, 
it's not this crazy responsibility to run from like guys do. It's actually an amazing responsibility. Like God has given you the orders of taking your children and help raise them up to where we have sons growing up, knowing their identity, knowing their purpose. We helped them form it, but we're listening to God and we're looking for natural gifts and talents in our sons. And thank God, man, if, if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, our daughters are going up knowing their worth. Does that mean your daughter will never mess up? No. Does it mean your son will never mess up? No. But are you going to give them a chance? I joke about it all the time with my guys when, when we're in prison, we're talking to stuff, man. Uh, when, I, when a guy comes up to my house or when a guy meets one of my daughters and he's like, hey, I'd like to take you out. I want her to first let him know before you even think about it, you know you got to come meet my dad, right? I'm like, there ain't no sense in even talking about it. If you're not going to come meet my dad. But when he asks for my daughter or tell, tells her that he likes her and he wants to take her out, I want her first thing to be, hey, where do you go to church, fool? Right. Yeah, what church do you go to? Because I want that to be a priority to her. Like, if you're not in church and you're not invested in church, you ain't got nothing to offer me. I want to instill that in my daughters, man. If a man is not in church, what in the world does he have to offer my daughter right. whenever he's not underneath somebody getting fed? Will it go down just like that? I have no idea. I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind going back to prison. I did 11 years, so it ain't no big deal. <laughs> At least I know what I'm going back for next time. You know what I'm saying? But I'm going to give my daughters that chance. They're not going to get the excuse when they get older that my dad never said I, he loved me. Right. And they're not going to get the excuse saying, I didn't know what my worth is because my dad never told me. Right. They won't have that excuse. They're not going to get to say that I had a dad and he wasn't there. I had a dad, but I don't know him. I had a dad, but he wasn't interested. My kids are not going to have that chance. I'm going to give them every shot they got, and I'm going to pray my guts off, and I'm going to keep guns and knives and all that handy. <laughs> Bow and arrow. Bow and arrow. <laughs> and pray that they do well. But if I don't do anything else right, my kids are going to know that I love them. They're going to know that I love them. They're going to know that I cared. And they're going to know that I was involved as much as I could be. Because I understand something. About, well, one, because I love them. Good grief, man. How can you not love kids? But two, because I care, man. I want to do my best shot at giving them the best shot. My, man, my wife wrote me the coolest letter uh, when I, I left this morning to get some a long time ago. When I came back home, I had this Father's Day letter from her. And uh, she was telling me about uh, the, the way that I love Jesus and the way that I pursue him every day is, is the, the uh, two best things that I can pass down to my daughters. And I won't admit to crying. Will not admit it. But I thought about that on the way over here, and that is the two best things I can offer my daughters. To show them by example that, man, I do love Jesus and I'm chasing him with everything that I got. Because everything that I've been through in my life, that's all that matters. At the end of the day, that's all that matters. Will y'all stand up with me? You know, if there's, there's people in here that are still offended with their, their earthly dad, the cool thing about God is, is he's not into robots. He doesn't make us do anything. Because I had somebody tell me the other day, if God really loved me, then why did he let this happen? If God really loved me, why did he give me a dad that didn't care? And I, you know, if God really... The cool thing about God is he gives everybody choice. What sucks is, is when people make the wrong choices and our kids got to pay the consequences for it. Because now they're left with questions that they can't answer. If God really loved me, why did he give me you? Those are tough questions to answer to somebody. I mean, we get it. We get it from a Bible standpoint. We know what God's doing. But man, to try to give them an adequate answer that's going to erase everything Dad did puts you in a pretty tough spot. Like, I'm sorry that your dad made the choices that he did, but God's not that way. It's a really tough position to be in. But if there's anybody in here that's still offended with Dad... I pray that we can let that go today. Because God, your heavenly Father, is nothing comparable to your earthly dad. Y'all that had awesome dads, that's great. That's fantastic. But how do you minister fatherhood when there's a room full of women? Oh my gosh. If there was anything a woman was ever affected by, it was fatherhood. Because your dad either destroyed you with his words or he built you up with his words. And if he destroyed you, I don't want, to, I want you to spend the rest of your life offended at your dad and having a hard time receiving the love of the Father who really knows how to love you well. 
And to the fathers that are in the same way, you may have had a horrible dad. But all that needs to end today if that's what's stopping you from loving God and being loved by God because he's nothing like that. But you've got to give him a chance. And two, who better for us to learn from on how to be a dad than listening to God? I don't want to keep filling up the prisons because we're not raising our boys to know their identity and their purpose. And I don't want to keep filling up prisons. With, I don't want to keep losing women to the streets because they don't know their worth. Fatherhood is an amazing responsibility that I hope we embrace and I hope we teach it. And we talk to it about the guys when we go down there. There's so many of these guys that we talk to down there, their kids, have, they don't even get a chance to go home and stop the cycle. Their kids are already in juvenile before their dad comes home. Because some of these guys get saved, they get motivated, they can't wait to go home and be a dad to that son and I'm going to pour into him, pour into him, then he gets a letter saying, your son's in juvenile because he robbed some store or he pulled a gun on a cop or he... And man, you ought to see how bad it beats them up. They're like, man, I just wanted to get, I wanted to get there before something happened. Fatherhood. Let's pray.